There's a moment when the sun disappears, when darkness falls and you're left with just your fears. That's the moment you feel your first pang of doubt. That's the moment when the night comes out. When the Night Comes Out presents Hellhound, Part 3. It's time to learn what the beast lurking within no man's land is all about. It turns out man has done more than awakened the horrors within themselves. No, there's always something a bit more terrifying lurking when the night comes out. Bobby grabbed Marty's shoulder and pulled his friend along with him. Joseph's eyes were visibly wet as he gazed at what remained of the men in the dust. He wiped at his eyes. Coming, Joseph? Bobby asked. Yeah, yes. What choice do I have? We're not heading back down into those tunnels, Marty stated. No, Prudence said calmly. There's no need. I know you spoke to the old man. The old man is mad. He's ancient, you know, and hasn't had his faculties for many years. This is why we are in such terrible danger. Let's find a place to sit and discuss. Bobby wasn't sure he could take much more, but the human brain has an ability to push aside even the greatest of horrors to continue functioning. This was the essence of war. How many European soldiers had seen horrors beyond what the Americans had seen? The world was a vast, giant machine, churning and spinning in an endless void. Man fought over pieces of this earth when the rest of the universe was so empty and black. It didn't make sense. Humans thought they could tame the machine, use it for their own purposes. It was laughable. Now Bobby knew the tales of the old had some ring of truth. There were demons. There were forces at work beyond earth, fire, water, and air. Monsters existed. Who would presume to be able to control such forces? Why even try? They walked down the street, coming into the old town square again. Prudence found a seat on a large piece of broken stone. She appeared tired now, as Bobby stared at her face in greater detail. How old was she? She looked to be a young girl, perhaps in her late teens or early twenties, but she might have been a thousand years old. There was an aura of age around her. Bobby took a seat opposite her, his bones tired from hours of fear and running around. Marty plopped down heavily beside him, his head down. Joseph took a spot to Prudence's right, also looking defeated. The rest of the men created a loose circle around them all. They were quiet, their thoughts turned inward. So, what do you know? Bobby asked. What can you tell us? Prudence sighed. I'm much older than I appear. I am not as old as the man you spoke to earlier but I've been around a long time. Most of the people here have. You see, the old man is correct. There is magic in this ground. There are many places like this around the world. Places where odd things happen. Sometimes things disappear without explanation. Sometimes there are strange lights in the sky. Sometimes just strange sensations, ghosts, spirits, monsters. These are places where the walls between this reality and others are very thin. Things leak through, at times break through, walk around among us. For centuries there were men who could summon and ask those things for favors, break into the other realities, control what they found. 
They were given many names, such as wizards or warlocks, but it was the natural order of things to control these creatures and the realities. Things changed, though. Bobby felt a strange sensation in his mind. Suddenly, his brain was filled with images of what she was saying. Images of old men in robes, carrying staffs like something out of a fairy tale book. Men who could reach into what appeared to be thin air and pull monsters from it. Men and women who could summon the energy between worlds to do magnificent things, or command weather, trees, plants, and animals. The problem is men grew old and died off. Prudence continued. The rituals were handed down, mouth by mouth and word by word. Let us say, things got lost in those translations. The walls between realities hardened over time too. The words and abilities dimmed. The old man is many, many years old, but he doesn't have the true essence of the magic anymore. He's been disconnected. He wanted to protect us. His kind had done so before, many times. They summoned energies from multiple worlds to hide the village, move it. All of reality can be malleable if you know how to manipulate the energies. This time, though, the old man wanted to do something he felt would allow the village to stay where it was, but protect the people. The spells and rituals were old and incomplete, though. He reached into the darkest words and books to try and find the right solution. I told him not to. Prudence shuddered. In his mind, Bobby saw all of this happen. The villagers, all of them from ancient clans going back centuries, standing fearful as the guns and soldiers got closer. They saw what the future beheld. Nightmares from the air, gas fired from guns, poisoning and killing those who ran, trenches featuring mud mixed with blood, the tons of earth thrown up by bigger and bigger shells. War had come time and again. Sometimes they knew in advance and had been able to hide, other times they had to fight. This time, the Elder wanted to do a little bit of both. I told him the ritual was incomplete, and he was dealing with elements he could not possibly understand. These were primordial forces, the things which existed before man himself crawled out of ooze to become humans, before the worlds we know sit upon and stare at in the sky. There was another universe. Creatures like the one you just saw lived there, but also far, far worse. Giant beasts which eventually warred, destroyed each other, or left themselves in a state of constant sleep. They were eventually banished to a deep, dark world hidden at the center of the multiverse. They sleep now, waiting to be summoned. The old man wished to summon at least one of them, perhaps one close to our universe. Risk tearing apart the entire multiverse to bring one of those old creatures here. Bobby saw the ritual behind closed eyes within his mind. It took days. Animals were sacrificed and blood spread. The pages within the books were old, and languages even the old man no longer understood. Prudence begged him to stop. Meanwhile, outside, the bombs fell, the soldiers fired their guns, the machine guns tore people apart, the siege weapons pounded the earth again and again. The shells fell upon the village now. Soldiers were getting closer. The ritual was completed, but it seemed nothing happened. The village started to move underground. The first group of soldiers to come were the French, Prudence said. They sent a large group here, hoping to get some sort of advantage around the German trenches. They wanted to build a base here perhaps fortify the entire town. Those of us who had not yet gone underground watched as they came. The old man was there too. It wasn't long before the beast appeared. Bobby saw this too, the columns of soldiers approaching as the sun went down. 
their guns over their shoulders, the sound of the feet like something alive, moving and twisting towards them. The villagers looked on with dread and fear mixed with resignation. Their rituals didn't work. Then, the beast appeared. The shadows formed into the giant maw, the red eyes. It attacked with a ferocity no one could have anticipated. Even the old man was shocked to see when it tore straight into the columns of men. They died by the scores, blood exploding into the air as if bombs dropped from the skies. The soldiers tried to fight, but it was hopeless. So those who had not been slaughtered in the first attack ran in the direction of the first place they saw. They ran towards the village. We hid, Prudence said. We hid in the tunnels, most of us anyway. There were a few who stayed behind to watch the soldiers. They told us later how the soldiers had been cut down, but a few of them made it. We kept out of sight, most of us wondering why any of them had survived. Why? The beast was supposed to protect us. Why bring the soldiers in? Prudence looked down at her hands, shifting a bit as she did so. The memories made her uncomfortable. Her eyes were distant, reflecting the dimming light. Those first soldiers just spent one night here. She continued. The next day, they tried to leave. They were determined to fight whatever they ran into. The beast appeared again, but this time, they got off a few shots. However, as you have seen, the beast appears as a dog, but it is not. It's shadow, darkness. They never stood a chance. They were cut down and tore apart, shredded into pieces of meat. We stood and watched as it devoured the last of them, coming back again and again until every last scrap of those soldiers was gone. The images just kept coming in Bobby's head. When he opened his eyes, he saw the others were feeling the same thing. They had looks of terror on their faces, seeing the things Prudence had experienced. At some point, Bobby realized she was no longer speaking. The images came from her mind. Bobby closed his eyes again and could see the sun, feel the stones beneath his feet as if he were back there standing with the village. The villagers, with the building still standing, although they would fall soon, gathered to argue over what had happened. There was a terrific row between the old man, the elders among them, and the younger members. This was not what was supposed to happen. The elder gods were supposed to protect them. This thing appeared uncontrollable and had brought the soldiers into the village. It was at this time the old man came up with a story about the beast trying to bring soldiers into the village to force them to work together. The younger members didn't buy it. So far, just the French had come and they hadn't stayed. What was this? The other elders said the old man could see into the future and the younger were being rude. The argument grew until one of the younger members and one elder ended up in a physical fight. They were separated, told to cool down. The next morning, the younger villager who had started the fight gathered 15 others and stated they were leaving. They wanted nothing to do with elder gods, beasts, other worlds, or man's wars. They were going to find another place to live and start over. There was a larger argument, but the younger men won out. Prudence said goodbye to the man who was to be her husband and she stood at the edge of the village as the younger men stepped out into the empty area just beyond. They looked back at the village, but they kept going. Bobby felt the horror in her heart when the shadows appeared. The men froze, unable to understand what was happening, until the first man, in the lead, was torn to pieces. The howl which came next caused most of them, including Prudence's betrothed, to run. They never got close. She looked into his eyes, his right hand extended towards her despite being at least 50 yards away, as the claws from the beast ripped through him from behind. She saw his spine come out his chest and his eyes went dark. Blood erupted from his mouth in a fountain. Then his head was gone, 
then he was torn in half. The villagers divided then. Half of them wanted to kill the old man. The old man tried to explain they were not allowed to leave the village for their own protection. The beast was doing what it had been summoned to do, protecting them from the war, protecting them from the world of men. Those who didn't want to hear it anymore moved underground first. Prudence and ten others moved further down into the tunnels, the older tunnels. Up above, the rest of the village tried to make their lives as normal as possible, but the guns of men roared. The shells fell. The planes flew over the village and more soldiers came only to be killed out in the field, and more of them sought refuge within the walls. Every time they would try to leave and the beast would return to finish them off. Eventually, there was little left of the village, and the rest of its residents came down into the tunnels. They built their homes within the darkness, carved from stone walls, creating as much light as possible and trying to bring a normal life to their families. Since then, we just wait to die. Prudence spoke again. I do know soldiers keep coming. They come and they die, but it does nothing to stop the war. It's as if the beast actually draws them here somehow. There have been others in the village who have tried to leave, but were also killed. Prudence sighed, her head down. She wiped her eyes. I think as you do, Bob. She whispered, looking into his face. I think the old man tried to use dark magic all there than he was, he didn't know what he was doing and something was summoned, but not what he originally intended to bring here. Something evil. Perhaps the ancient magic of this place prevents it from coming in, but I notice it is getting closer. It is the closest to the village it has ever been when I saw it just now. I think the village is dying, and soon it will be within the streets. It will come down into the tunnels and kill all of us. She shuddered, her breath hitched in her chest, and shrugged. Or we will just die from starvation or something else. We may live a long time, but death comes to all of us. Bobby felt as if he had been drained of his life force entirely. He slumped as the hold over his mind and the images he had been seeing stopped. There was nothing, he thought. Nothing. What could he do? If the hellhound outside was not of flesh and blood, what was there? So what do we do? Joseph asked. His eyes were bright with tears from what he had seen. He chewed at his lower lip nervously. What do you mean? Prudence asked. Well, we can't just sit here and not do anything. Joseph said. If that thing out there is getting closer, are we just going to wait for it? We have to get out of here. We have to get away from the villagers who want to believe in a crazy old man. You saw what the hound did, Bobby retorted. What do you think we can do? It's not even flesh and blood. There's nothing to shoot. You can't set it on fire or blow it up. What does it want? Joseph asked. I don't understand. Prudence said, confusion on her face. It was summoned here and is skinning. The old man has twisted his brain into knots to convince himself and others it's killing to somehow bring about peace to the world. You think it's out there just to kill. Why? How much will it kill? Why is it killing? What is the purpose of its existence now it's here in our world? Prudence thought about this for a moment. I don't know. Maybe it has no purpose. Maybe in trying to bring back one of the elder gods, we brought back something of pure evil, which does nothing but survive on human flesh. You saw the faces and its hide, didn't you? Bobby realized she had directed the question to him. Yes. It must absorb them in some way. Prudence continued. 
Perhaps it's growing stronger. It seems so. It's gotten even bigger since we first saw it. Soon it will tower over the trees. But it makes no sense, Joseph protested. Even the elders, as you call them, would be afraid of such a thing. What if it's a minion of one of these ancient ones you mentioned? Marty said, his eyes staring straight ahead at a point on the ground. What if the elder gods waged war too? You said they did, didn't you? The hound might be a weapon. Maybe it's part of why the elders had to be banished. Maybe even they had no control over the weapons they created. Things like the hound. The words hung in the air like fireflies. All of them imagined the giant beasts of the elder gods being torn apart by the beast they saw. If this were true, Bobby thought, then the hound must be infinitely bigger than what they saw. Something so big it would never stop. What about the tunnels? Joseph asked. How far into the distance underground do they go? Can we get out of here by entering the tunnels and traveling away from this place? Where do they lead? Prudence shook her head. Not far enough. Could we extend them? Joseph insisted. We just need to get past this field, right? The beast did not attack us in the road. It didn't attack us ten miles from here. It seems bound to this place. Prudence thought about this for a moment. Perhaps, perhaps it could work. Many of the tunnels have collapsed over the years. It won't be easy. Plus, the old man and some other elder villagers will protest. However, are you prepared to dig tunnels? You're all weak and exhausted, battered by war. Bobby felt a faint spark of hope. We can deal with the villagers. As for the rest, you find out quickly here men can do anything when it comes to survival. We're discussing moving stones, large stones, without equipment to break them up. Are you all strong enough to move stones? We damn well have to be, Marty replied. They walked down into the tunnels later that same night. Prudence led them to the area off to the left, away from the brightness of the main square. Once they arrived, they found it was equally bright in this part of the tunnels, but only after walking through much darkness. As if the darkness itself were a barrier to keep the others out. This part of the tunnel system was older. The stone and brick was run down and falling over in many areas. Moss grew on the stones, and water dripped from all corners. The men shed their coats and outer garments. They found another tunnel which had collapsed and determined it would be the best one to dig out and extend. All hoped maybe the tunnel went farther than it appeared. How long they worked the first night, Bobby did not know, since time and the tunnels no longer held any meaning. It felt good to have something to work on instead of thinking about mystics, magic, elder gods, and shadow beasts. It was always better to work than face death. At some point, they all reached the extent of their energies and collapsed in exhaustion. They smiled and felt good, though, having cleared away roughly 15 feet into the tunnel. The walls seemed sound, sturdy, but already scraps from the surface were used to shore up weak points. We had never thought of trying... Prudence whispered in the darkness as she and Bobby sat side by side, looking at the tunnel. You live with the thing long enough, you soon can't see anything else but... Bobby nodded in agreement. Are you going to leave with us if this crazy scheme works? Yes, I suppose I must. There's nothing for us here. Look at some of the villagers who came here and started to help. Not all of them were living in this part of the tunnels just this morning. People are tired of the lies and fear. At least ten, maybe fifteen villagers had come to help them dig out the tunnel. They also sat around, scattered about the area, murmuring. 
The looks of exhaustion and fear on their faces tugged at Bobby's heart. He wanted more than ever to get out of here and bring them with. Perhaps he could do just one good thing during this war by saving these people. They all rested for a few hours. Down in the darkness, it was impossible to know what time it was. Bobby checked his watch to find it had stopped. When he wound it, the device refused to tick again. Time was funny down here, he mused. The villagers themselves were ancient, or so Prudence told him, so time passed differently for them. Perhaps it was something within the air. They had summoned some ancient magic from the depths, filled the tunnels, and surrounded the village. He was tempted to ask Prudence how old she was, but it seemed indelicate. After a few hours where Bobby dozed off for a time, they got back to their feet and started digging again. The work was steady and went on for hours and hours. They used some of the stones to hold up what remained of the roof. Eventually, the tunnel began to emerge. The walls became clear, and they got past where things had fallen in. The new tunnel was not very stable, and this worried Bobby, but once they were past the blockage, they found themselves in a dark tube which seemed to extend far into the distance. How far do you think this goes? Marty asked as Bobby stood holding a torch, gazing into the new channel. No idea. Bobby replied. I can't see any further than you can. I hope far enough. You think this will really work? Marty asked. It has to. Joseph chimed in, standing to Bobby's right. But we should be the ones who head down there and see how far it goes. There may be another blockage just past where the light of this torch flickers. Why us? Marty asked. In case you haven't noticed, we've sort of become the leaders of this group. Joseph said with a grin. I never intended to be, but we are. Here's another thing to worry about. What do we do when we get out of here? Bobby asked. We're supposed to be shooting at each other. Do we just go back to what we were doing before we ended up here? Joseph's face grew grim. I do not plan to, my friend. I plan to get out of this country, to hide somewhere until this war is over. I also plan to get very drunk until I forget all about magic and old gods. I knew war would be scary, Marty added. But I didn't think the nightmares I had as a kid would be real over here. It's madness. Everything here is madness. Well, how do we do this? Bobby asked. We should get a few supplies and head down, but we must head back at some point and let everyone know if it's clear. Feel up to go in now? Marty asked. Doesn't seem to be much point in waiting, Bobby said. Truth be told, he was afraid. He was a bit claustrophobic, and being underground was not helping. Still, there was no other way. Are you heading out now? Prudence's voice echoed off the walls. Bobby faced her. We need to get some idea of how far this goes. I should go with you, she said. It's best to keep it small, he replied. Why do you men feel the need to act so foolish? If this is our chance, perhaps we should all go. None of you should go. The voice came from behind them. Not loud, but commanding nonetheless. Bobby turned and was not surprised to see Abraham and the old man. Why do you come down here, old man? Prudence asked. What we do down here doesn't matter to you. Don't be stupid, woman. The old man spat. If you try this, you will die. If you attempt this, you risk bringing the beast closer, perhaps even into the tunnels with us. The beast is up there, Marty added, pointing to the ceiling despite the man's blindness. We're down here. 
The creature up there is a scion of the other gods. Do you think it cares or knows the difference between up there and down here? It's made of shadow. Where are there more shadows than down here? Don't try to stop us, old man, Joseph said. We're going to see if this tunnel will take us out of here. Oh, the tunnel goes on far enough to take you miles away. However, the hound will not let you leave. Then you admit what you told us before was nonsense, Bobby accused. You summoned a creature you cannot control, something which will make its way in here and kill everyone. I make no claims, child. The old man spoke defiantly. It will leave when men surrender their guns. Once a man has submitted to the other gods, to the universe, and stopped its war, the beast will return from where it came. Bobby, Marty, and Joseph looked at each other nervously. The old man had a way of speaking to the center of your brain. It was very convincing. He could feel his resistance waning. Are you going to stop us? Bobby asked. If I must. Abraham produced a gun from his waistband and held it pointed at the soldiers. Bobby recognized it as one of his soldiers' sidearms. The old man also had a gun. Despite his clouded eyes, he had the barrel pointed directly at Bobby's forehead. This is crazy, Bobby said, his voice calm but his heart hammering. He crawled his right hand toward the holster on his hip. We need not shoot. We can't become the thing we hate up above. Think about what you're doing, old man, Marty said. You said we had to put the guns down. We had to turn away from violence. None of us have guns on us. Which is it? The old man's face twisted in pain. It's beyond my control. Don't you see? I have to protect my people. And if that means I have to turn to violence to do it, then sacrifice myself. So be it. Let us go, Bobby said. Let us take the tunnel as far as we can. It may be blocked just a few feet beyond where our torches can shine. The bombing here has been intense. If it's blocked, there's not much we can do. We won't have the numbers or the strength to move every blockade, but if it's open, we can all get out of here. We can leave the beast. Let the soldiers come and feed it, but perhaps the soldiers will not come. Perhaps they will abandon this place and the beast will just die of starvation, or at least go back to where it came from. You tampered with something you didn't understand, Joseph accused. Now your people are paying for it. The above world is already filled with horror and death. All you did was summon more horror and death. You opened a door through with something no one on this planet has had to deal with before. How can you know what it will do? It will not protect. It will feed and feed until it has eaten its fill. You know this. We need to leave. This village needs to be abandoned. This is my home, the old man said, his blank eyes filled with tears. You ask me to abandon the place I have lived my entire life. If you had any idea how long this life is, you would not ask me. I will stay behind. Abram. Get as many of the others as you can. I will go with these men for a ways. Perhaps I can protect them or offer assistance with the beast, or anything else which might be hiding under the ground. I will then stay behind here, and the village can leave. Perhaps sacrificing myself to the hound will stop it. Abraham looked stricken. Don't ask me for such things. Hush now, son. The old man replied. I need you to lead these people to someplace else. Someplace far from the wars and the evils of the world. If you can, forget the magic of our people too. I see now how it can bring such a horrible evil. Abraham wanted to protest. One look at his face showed how much he did not want this to happen. He looked down at his gun, then put it into his waistband. He helped the old man down the small embankment until he could join the soldiers. Will you be able to walk? Abraham asked. 
I'll be fine, the old man replied. Gentlemen, let's go a ways down. We'll see if this tunnel is open. If it appears it is, I give poor Michonne to get as many out as you can. I'll do my best to keep the others at bay. Bobby didn't trust the old man, and he didn't trust Abraham at his back with a gun, but it seemed futile to keep arguing. Instead, he nodded agreement to a man who appeared blind and held a torch above his head. Ready? He asked Marty and Joseph. Both indicated they were and held their own torches aloft. With the old man beside him, Bobby took point and they stepped into the tunnel. The darkness beyond just a few feet seemed absolute. Despite the torches and flickering flames, there were shadows all around. It was as if the darkness were devouring the light and the light somehow sustaining it. Every few seconds, Bobby felt his heart jump to double speed when he thought he saw something move out of the corner of his eye. Every time, he'd move his torch and turn to see, only to find nothing. The walls seemed further away than they had been in the other tunnels. When the walls could be seen, the brick was covered in wetness and some kind of slick slime which shone the light back at them. Water ran down the middle of the walkway where they strode in a small channel like a tiny river or stream. The old man did not hesitate once. He appeared not to notice the darkness. Bobby figured he could probably see as well as if it were daylight, Never once did he stumble or have to search for the right path. Because of his sure-footedness, the old man was soon in the lead with Bobby behind him, then Joseph and Marty in the rear. I think we're right at the edge of the village, the old man whispered. Beyond this, and we'll be past the border. I can smell the blood the beast has soaked into the ground above. This brought no comfort to them. They could not smell blood. Bobby smelled body odor and fear. None of them had bathed in days. If the beast was truly like a dog, then all of them would smell for miles. As if doing so might stave off an attack, they moved slower and more carefully. Bobby looked down at his feet, trying to avoid kicking any loose stones or stepping loudly into a puddle. The shadows grew darker, more oppressive. It seemed they were lost in a vast sea of darkness, perhaps in the deepest regions of outer space. Their torches showed no walls, did not indicate a beginning or end to the tunnel. I don't know about you guys, but I think something's happening here. Marty whispered. You see something? Bobby asked. I'm not sure. I keep looking back. There's a few pinpricks a lot from where we came. It looks like something keeps walking between us and the light. It's probably just to trick the light, Bobby assured. He didn't want to turn around and look. He felt the hairs up and down his back stand at attention, like electricity running through his body. Just keep an eye on it. I think I see it too, Joseph added. I turned around and saw the flickering lights and suddenly they were gone for a moment. Maybe it's one of the villagers following us, Bobby hoped. Maybe Abraham decided to follow us after all. He might do such a thing, the old man said. He has always been willful and doesn't like to listen. However, I fear this may be something else. I can sense something around us, something evil. Bobby walked faster. Let's see what we can find down the tunnel. None of it will matter if the hound gets down here, Marty said, his voice rising in fear. We need to turn back. Bobby felt a sudden determination. No, we have to get out of here. We have to find out what's up ahead. If it's behind us, we're screwed anyway. Maybe if we show we're going back, it won't kill us, Joseph said. You saw those men up there try to run back, Bobby countered. It won't forgive us. We have to try, Marty said. Marty's hand fell on his shoulder with an iron grip. Bobby stopped. Bobby, stop it, Marty said. You won't be able to save Prudence or any of the other villagers if the hound is here. 
We need to turn back. Bobby turned around to see what everyone was looking at. He saw just darkness, but far in the distance, like staring at a distant star flickering in the substance of space. The light flashed and grew dimmer, but remained constant. It felt as if he stared for hours and was about to tell them they were all crazy and paranoid when something moved across the lights. One moment he could see the flames in the distance, then they were gone. They remained gone for several seconds before returning. Whatever it is, is closer, too. Agreed. Joseph replied. Something is happening. I can feel it. The surrounding shadows are moving. Bobby felt pure, raw panic rise in his chest. What had he done? How would they get out of this? Trying to run on the uneven ground with chunks of brick from the crumbling tunnel walls was guaranteed to break an ankle. There was no way to run. He swiveled his head, moving the torch as he did so. Bobby still couldn't see the surrounding walls, but he saw what the old man was talking about. The shadows undulated in a way which had nothing to do with the torch flames. It was similar to what they had seen up above when the hound appeared. The shadows were alive, crawling like fingers up and down, pulling together. It was as if something alive and very dark massaged the walls, caressed the light. Bobby, Marty whispered. And the single word was a plea for him to do something. Command them. Decide. No. Bobby hissed under his breath. It was the only word his mind would accept. No, no, no. What do we do? Joseph asked. Bobby sensed the panic rising in his voice, too. I'll stop it. The old man stepped forward in front of the men. Around them, the darkness swarmed and gathered. The teeth formed, and around the red eyes, a head. Bobby could see it now despite the darkness. It really did look like a giant hound. Pointed ears and snarling mouth with sharp white teeth. A low growl filled the tunnel with vibrations Bobby felt in his chest. The old man was speaking, but it was a language none of them had heard before. He gestured with both hands, the fingers entwining, crossing over one another. He waved his arms, sketching symbols in the air. The hound formed 15 feet from them. The light in the distance was blocked and Bobby's torch flickered as if there were a great wind pounding down the chamber of the tunnel. Wait, Bobby said. He had the smallest germ of an idea, but it was incomplete. He just knew what the old man was doing would get him and the rest of them killed. The growling grew more intense. The old man sketched more symbols in the air, then spat on the ground. With a swift move belying his age, he ripped open his shirt. Bobby couldn't see from the angle he stood, but his bet was the man's chest was covered in more symbols and runes. We have to stop him, Marty said, and he took several steps towards the old man. The hound let out a bark. <coughs> the sound was like a thunderclap, and the sound wave hit Bobby hard in the chest like a baseball bat. Joseph collapsed to his knees. Marty nearly fell, catching himself at the last minute. Bobby also managed not to fall, but for several seconds he could hear nothing but ringing in his ears. His eyes watered. The hound's mouth opened, and he saw saliva drip from the teeth. The old man walked to within just a few feet of the hound. Now his arm movements were even more intense, almost hard to follow with the naked eye blurs of motion. He had not slowed even when the sound hit him. Energy crackled from the darkness, and when the old man raised his right fist, something like lightning flew to his hand. The energy snaked and caressed his skin. He held this fist of energy aloft and spoke two more sentences to the beast. Then, silence. The beast lowered its head, and to Bobby's surprise, sniffed the air and at the old man's chest. 
The old man, to his credit, did not move. Energy held within his closed fist, barely contained. Seconds ticked on as they stood a few feet, then mere inches apart. Bobby's hearing began to return. The hound snarled suddenly, and the low vibration growl returned. The old man hurled curses at the beast, and he reared his arm back like he was about to throw a baseball. The energy grew brighter, from the white sun blues of lightning to pure white. The hound moved first, and moved like shadows. The teeth, red eyes, and formations of its body grew blurry for a fraction of a second. These shadows surrounded the old man in the blink of an eye, then returned to its position in front of him. It all happened so fast, it took all of those staring in disbelief a moment to realize what had happened. <laughs> the old man opened his mouth in a mixture of shock, pain, and horror. He looked up at his arm with his whitened eyes. Above him was no longer a fist of energy, but a ragged stump, which dripped blood down his arm and spattered his face. The hound chewed. There was the sickening sound of bones crunching in its mouth. The energy gathered within the fist crackled and spat around its muzzle. It appeared completely unfazed by any of it. We have to run, Bobby said. We have to run now. Marty couldn't move. Instead, he opened his mouth and screamed. Bobby pushed him hard in the back and he staggered forward before breaking into a run. Bobby looked back and saw Joseph was already in a full sprint. The old man screamed. His voice was like gravel, the sound of his pain so rough and miserable. Whatever bravado he might have had when he stepped up to his creation was gone. He tried to speak more of his magical words, but the hound swiped at the man's face with one giant paw. There was the loud sound of flesh tearing and bones breaking. Bobby saw this out of the corner of his eye as they ran past. One moment the man was speaking, then the shadowy hound's front paw moved and there was a spray of blood. The man's lower jaw, tongue, and teeth were gone, his throat ripped open. Blood sprayed the hound, but to Bobby's horror, the shadow creature absorbed it all. He saw the faces again within the dark fur of the creature this time all concentrating on the blood spattering across its body. The open mouths of the men the beast had killed drank hungrily, absorbing the old man's essence. From that moment on, Bobby could not see what was happening. He didn't want to. They had run past the man and the hound. He could still hear, though. He heard the old man gurgling, still trying to breathe. It was wet and sickening, with a loud whooping sound as his lungs breathed through the hole in his neck. Then the growl returned and there was the sound of more tearing flesh mixed with crunching bones. The wheezing stopped. They hadn't gotten far. The flickering lights in the distance still looked too much like distant stars in the night sky. The beast was finished with its meal quickly, and the surrounding shadows formed once again in front of the fleeing men. The hound filled the tunnel. It was massive, and the teeth gleamed with saliva and blood. Its eyes burned with red hate and anger, the growling shaking Bobby's bones, rattling the ancient stones around them and sending fine dust down onto their heads. Bobby froze. All of his limbs ceased to listen to his brain's commands. He could do nothing but stare at the hound. He could see nothing but the hound. Marty had the opposite reaction. He screamed something Bobby couldn't quite understand, but it was some form of denial. Perhaps of the hound's existence. Perhaps of the impending doom which sat before them. Perhaps of the circumstances which had led him to this point. Marty dodged to his left and tried to run past the beast. Bobby could see his friend's face, set as if carved in stone. The look was pure determination. The hound barely moved its eyes. Marty was parallel with it for a moment. Then the shadow shifted and Marty flew through the air, his face a tattered mess. Bobby's friend flew past him and crumpled to the ground five feet to Bobby's right. No! 
There was nothing Bobby could do. He forgot about the hound or where he was. He ran to the man who had become his only friend in this world of nightmares. Marty was the first person he met when he arrived in France. He had an easy smile and casual way about him. He charmed everyone he met, and the company loved him. Marty made friends easily, but he and Bobby held some strange bond. They couldn't have been more different, but they latched on to each other. They had gone over the top together, had trudged through the mud and blood together, fired their rifles, attacked German trenches with bayonets together. They had huddled in trenches while the shelling went on and on above them together. Bobby ran to his friend. He knew the hound watched him as he did. He knew his running might trigger the beast and that in any moment the creature might attack. Bobby heard Joseph say something in German, perhaps a curse, perhaps a prayer. Bobby knelt down to Marty's crumpled form. The way his friend lay on the ground, he knew he was likely gone. There were just limbs and clothing. Legs and arms splayed and twisted over each other to the point where it was hard to discern one from the other. Bobby grabbed his friend and rolled him onto his back. Marty's right arm was barely attached to his shoulder. It had torn the right side of his face. Bobby could see Marty's teeth and jaw on the right side. Marty! Bobby called out. Jesus, Marty! To his shock, Marty's eyes opened and his eyeballs rolled in their sockets for a moment. Then they locked onto Bobby's and he stared at his friend. I'm sorry, Marty said. It was hard to understand him. His jaw had been shattered. His tongue flapped against his teeth. Blood ran down into the muck covering the ground. It soaked his clothes. I can feel it. Marty said, although it was very hard to understand him. Bobby leaned down to hear more clearly. It's absorbing me, sucking me up. It wants all of us, all of us. Hang on, Marty, Bobby said. He knew it was impossible. The blood pouring out of Marty's face and the damage done was too much. Please, stop fighting, Marty said, his eyes unfocused. Bobby could see the muscles in his face, now exposed, working to try forming words. Stop fighting. It feeds on war. It feeds on war? Bobby repeated. What do you mean? Please, Marty, don't go. Don't go, please. Marty was already going. His eyes rolled up into his head. Bobby could see the whites of his eyes while his jaw and tongue kept trying to form words. He held his friend close to his chest, and Marty's hand, covered in gore, reached out to clutch at his chest. Bobby felt his friend's fingers tense and dig into the fabric of his shirt. Marty's entire body stiffened in pain, then relaxed. The rattle of his last breath washed over Bobby, and then Marty was gone. Bobby held his friend and pulled his head closer to him. He rocked the body, uncaring about the mythical beast standing over him. He could feel the air as the hound moved, perhaps breathed. At this point, he didn't care anymore. Nothing mattered. The war didn't matter. Living, dying, didn't matter. What was war? War was people in the government deciding they wanted more. They wanted more land, more territory— for what purpose? The earth itself was a tiny ball of dirt floating in an endless void. Bobby didn't believe there was anything out in the void of space. There were stars and planets, perhaps with life, but Bobby doubted it. Were he God, he would have stopped with humans. Humans must have been the most disappointing of his creations. Built in God's own image and all they did was fight or kill. Did this mean God was death? Bobby hated God. He hated humans. He hated the governments of the world who manufactured the need for wars. These same people, all of whom sat hundreds of miles away in cushy offices and never once saw a trench or a bullet, sent thousands, perhaps millions, of young men to war. To fight the fights, they were too cowardly to fight on their own. 
What was the point of this war? Someone had assassinated a man thousands of miles away from Bobby's home. What did this have to do with his life there? Why did it matter at all? The entire world mobilized to create new ways of killing. It was just a few decades after the country Bobby called home had torn itself apart in its own civil war. He was done. He was done with it all. No more. There was nothing which could convince him any of this was worthwhile. At that moment, Bobby felt his mind expand and could see the future. This war to end all wars was anything but. There would always be more. Men had created guns which could fire more bullets faster. They'd built airplanes only to turn them into weapons. Humans had started this war because countries wanted to build bigger and bigger battleships. This would continue with bigger ships, bigger bombs, bigger airplanes. Man would build bigger submarines, bigger guns. Eventually, entire cities would be destroyed. When would it be enough? The entire planet? It was enough. It had to be enough. One person had to stand up and say no. Just one person who could say no, and then it might cascade. It's unlikely, but the wars had to stop. There had to be a way to stop it. Humans had infected the world with the desire for war. Humans had been born in blood and continued to bathe in it. Bobby kissed Marty's forehead. Slowly, gently, he set his friend's body on the ground. He didn't want to leave his friend within the mud and muck down here. This was no place for his friend. No place for any human being to be left behind. Neither was no man's land. Stop it, Bobby said. He felt the beast move. Joseph stood behind him too, just watching, frozen in horror. The shadow shifted and moved in a wave. He felt the presence of the beast over him, towering over him, filling the tunnel. Bobby felt tears course down his face. At one time, this would have embarrassed him, but not anymore. He tilted his head back and looked into the hound's face. There it was, just shifting shadows with parts both solid and unsolid. A creature which should not have existed, but... Here it was, summoned by a crazy old man who also wanted to stop war, but tapped into an ancient essence of madness and horror. Perhaps this was the hidden thing which had poisoned the world, turning it into what it was now. The universe, born from chaos, created by beasts like this. Ancient evils which slumbered, but their poisonous blood leaked through, contaminating this reality too. Man murdering man, even on massive scales, perhaps controlled by ancient evils they no longer believed in. Bobby got to his feet and spread his arms out wide. Then he tore open his jacket and shirt. I have no weapon, he said, looking down at Marty's body. He was my friend, you son of a bitch. The only friend I had over here in the chaos I think you helped create. I didn't create this mess. Bobby waved his arms around to indicate he meant the world, the war, the way humans were. I never wanted to hurt anything, ever, he said to the beast. I never hunted an animal, never deliberately harmed anyone. I just wanted to work on a farm, wanted to till the soil and grow things. I was sent here. They taught me how to kill, and I did so to survive. The beast growled, the teeth showing. Bobby saw Marty's face appear within the chest of the creature, there for a moment, then gone, like something deep within a pond. Let us live, Bobby said. Let those within the village out of here. We'll go away and not fight. They summoned you to protect them and now they're afraid. If you want to make a difference, you need to go to the front. See what the humans are doing there. You want souls? You want to feed off fear and war? There's the place you need to go. You can see into my mind. I can feel it. Just look and see what the front is. Then drain it. Drain all of it. Maybe if you have any capacity other than evil, you might be able to stop this. The beast cocked its head to the side, like a dog listening to its master's voice. Slowly, its massive head leaned down as Bobby closed his eyes. 
He waited for the pain of the bite. If he were lucky, perhaps it would bite his head clean off and there would be little to no pain. Get it over quick, he thought to himself. Instead of growling or the sensation of a bite, Bobby heard the hound sniffing at him. He felt the cold, wet nose against his left cheek, then down his neck. The sniffing continued down his body. How long this went on, Bobby did not know. His body shook in fear, waiting. The hound pulled back and growled. Bobby opened one eye and saw the beast sniff the air over its head. Then the massive head turned back towards Bobby. It was asking him a question. Bobby knew this suddenly as well as he knew he stood in the mud and muck. He knew it as well as he knew Marty, his friend, lay dead. Bobby got down on his knees, then lowered his head and arms to the floor of the tunnel. Prostrate now, he spoke to the beast. Do what you will to me, he said. I sacrifice myself for the rest of the village, for Joseph and the Germans. Just let them leave. Then go. Go to where you're needed. Go to the front and stop the war if you can. Stop people from killing each other. I'm done with it. I'd rather die here in a tunnel than go back to the hell of the front. Just do it quickly. How long did he lay there in the muck? The wetness of the floor seeped into the knees of his trousers. He felt the mud sticking to his face. He smelled ancient things rotting down here in the water, which seeped from the walls and probably from the primal parts of the earth itself. When a hand fell on his back, he nearly screamed. It was the last sensation he thought he'd feel. Get up, my friend, Joseph whispered to him. Bobby raised his head. The beast was gone. He turned his eyes up and saw Joseph there with a look of pure shock and some mix of happiness. What happened? Bobby asked, unsure if he was really still alive. He looked down at his muddy clothes. Where'd it go? It just vanished. Joseph replied. It was there, right over you, then sniffing at you, and then it was gone. The shadows just evaporated. Why did it go? Bobby mused more to himself than seeking an answer. I can only guess. Perhaps it was seeing you feel compassion for your friend. Perhaps it was you were the one person who did not try to fight it. You showed it what you really were. I don't know. Bobby nodded slowly. Maybe just one person showing they didn't want to fight was enough. Even the old man wanted to really use the beast as a weapon. Do you think it has left the village? Joseph asked. Can we get out of here? Not sure, but I think so. Bobby had another thought. I fear I may have just redirected it somewhere else. God help him. Joseph looked puzzled, but perhaps had had enough of mysteries and magic. They walked back the way they had come. The next morning, the villagers, along with the remaining soldiers, stood at the edge of the village. The world was brighter than it had been. No fog, and no funny feeling of time stretching or bending. The surrounding shadows did not seem alive, and there was no sensation of being watched. Bobby and the other soldiers had discarded their guns and uniforms. All of them wore the same style of dress and clothing as the villagers. Fabrics Bobby had never seen before, which were both light and warm. He held Prudence's hand. I think it's gone, she said. I do too. Are you willing to try? She didn't hesitate. They walked hand in hand out into the barren area surrounding the village. They made it all the way across to the pitted road so many soldiers had trod before. There would be more, too. They all knew it. However, the future soldiers would find an empty town which had completely fallen apart. Whatever had been here would travel with them. Looks like it's gone, Bobby said. Where should we go? If you and your fellow soldiers get caught, you'll be shot. 
she declared. But there are others like us, others who follow some of the old ways. They'll be happy to welcome us and I do. You'll learn our ways too, become one of us. It sounded like a fine life for Bobby. He could learn a new language and perhaps start farming like he had always hoped. Maybe he could find a spot to grow grapes. Making wine seemed like a fantastic way to spend the rest of his life. Let's get the rest and get going, he said, then kissed her on the lips. I can't wait to start a new life. How about you? Prudence admitted she felt the same. The soldiers huddled against the night. The weather, they said, was to turn colder tomorrow. It would bring rain, turning the trenches into mud holes and rivers of mud. It would make crossing no man's land nearly impossible as men and machines stuck fast within the thick soup the ground became. So at dawn, before the cold, they were to go over the top and charge the French across the way. The generals gave speeches about doing this for the good of Germany. They told them this would bring glory and victory to their homeland. Most of the men had seen countless charges, all of which led to nothing. No ground gained, just trenches. More mud, more dead. They huddled together, dreading the cold, wet weather as much as the machine gun fire. Wetness brought its own risks. Trench foot, rot. Carl was in his twenties, but already an old man in his mind. He had days' worth of growth on his face. His hair, hands, and clothes were caked with mud. He held his head down, trying to will himself to sleep. If this were to be his last chance at sleep, he wanted it to count. It was deep into the night, when all was most quiet, that Carl heard the odd noise above him. A strange sound like the air rushing during a storm. An unusual sensation in his chest followed this. It was the same feeling he got watching shells going off from a distance. Sometimes you felt the rumble through the ground and into your bones before you heard it. Was it growling? Carl opened his eyes and saw his companions also huddled. Heinrich snored as he always did, his head tilted back and mouth open to the night air. Many others shifted in their positions. Remain still, rest in whatever way you can. All of them, in a row between narrow mud walls reinforced by rotting wood. None of them had made the sound. Something dripped onto Carl's left hand. It burned. He gasped, and this time looked up. He saw red eyes. He saw teeth. Carl had enough time to register the fact the world had more horrors than just war. He opened his mouth and barely let out a scream. Carl was lucky. He died first and fast. The next morning, the French waited anxiously in their trench. Word was the Germans would charge at dawn. Across the field of craters and mud, a low-hanging dog clung to the earth. The machine gunners checked their weapons. The rest of them put on their helmets, fixed bayonets, waited. Dawn came and went. It baffled the generals. The intel was good. Why had they not charged? Eventually, a small division was sent across. Rare for daytime, but already clouds rolled in as a cold front pushed through. They crept to the German lines, waiting. Sure, this was some kind of trap an ambush. When they peered into the trench, they were indeed surprised. All that remained were pieces of men, torn to shreds, faces fixed in horror. What do we do about this? Asked one young soldier to one much older. We report it, was the reply. We report that and pray to God this madness eventually ends. Then pray, whatever took them, doesn't decide to visit our trench tonight. The clouds rolled in, and the rain started. As if trying to wash away the sins of man. As if trying to wipe away the blood. As if trying to make the world clean once again.
There are always things to fear worse than the horrors we inflict upon each other. War is madness. Murder is madness. Nature sees it and sees what we do to each other and cannot imagine what we will do to it in return. Sometimes, in the right circumstances, nature fights back. This is especially true when the sun vanishes and when the night comes out. You've been listening to When the Night Comes Out, a weekly horror anthology podcast with stories by Brian W. Alaspa and narrated by Ali James. Music by Kevin MacLeod and Vivek Abishek. For Brian's work, visit his website at brianwalaspa.com or visit amazon.com for his books of fiction and nonfiction. Be sure to listen to Ali's work on Facebook at Ali James Projects. Visit our website at whenthenightcomesout.com to learn how to support us on Patreon.